Okay, guys, there's a few in the uh, in the session there then. So good afternoon. My name is Spencer Hayes. I'm one of the um, members of Centre for Educational Neuroscience. Um, and good afternoon from London. I'm delighted to introduce uh, Dr. Daniel Paul, who is based in the Division of Neuroscience and Experimental Psychology at University of Manchester. His principal research interest is in attention and uh, perception in autism aiming to better understand autistic people's perceptual experiences, uh, where and when they cause certain challenges. He's on the steering committee of Autism at Manchester, which is a participatory research community of researchers, autistic people and their families. Um, he's got a exciting summer and um, autumn coming up as he'll be starting his new ESOC funded Fellowship at the University of Sheffield in September, looking at distraction and autism using cognitive neuro and qualitative research methods. His uh, title today is Investigating Timing Processes in Autism, and um, I'm delighted to introduce him. So over to you, Dan, and thanks a lot. Great, thanks, Spencer. Um, and yeah, I just want to say thanks uh, to Spencer for inviting me today. It's really nice to have opportunities like this to uh, present my work uh, to different audiences. Um, I'm going to be talking today about work that I've been doing on my current postdoc, um, which is uh, funded by the ESRC, yeah, uh, timing in autistic people. So the way I've set this talk up today, uh, there's two parts to this. Uh, in the first part, I'm going to be talking about a study in which we uh, used a survey to look at timing in daily life in autistic children. Uh, and then the second part is going to be a study uh, looking at uh, an experimental investigation of time perception in autistic adults. So I'm trying something a bit different today, um, just bearing in mind the audience for the talk. So I'm putting a bit of focus into the uh, study one, um, even though study two is a special piece of work. I think study one has a lot of potential interest and educational implications. So I'm going to be exploring that in a bit more uh, depth. So what am I talking about when I'm talking about uh, timing um, and time perception? Um, so timing, really we're referring to quite a distributed set of cognitive processes um, when we're thinking of timing and time perception. So a, a non-exhaustive list of some of the processes I'm thinking about, and these are just some that are going to be relevant to what I'm going to talk about today, um, include perception of duration. Now, this is the kind of thing that we do um, when crossing the road. So uh, when you go to a crossing, you press the button, uh, aware of how long it takes uh, for the green man to appear. Not only are you aware of, of, of the passage in that particular, at uh, that crossing, but also you can compare the crossings you've been to uh, in the past. We have representation of different durations we've experienced before. Uh, another domain of timing, relative timing. Uh, this is really how we pass different signals in time. Um, so this is important when we're uh, doing things like um, um, determining order and synchrony yeah, in different sensory signals. And then third is uh, a sort of broad area of, of temporal cognition. So what I'm referring to here is the sense of a, of a mental timeline that we all have, uh, both in our, ourselves and others. Uh, this is used to orient ourselves in time and, and to be able to refer to specific, specific events and where they fit into our uh, uh, lifeline. So I'm interested in time here in the context of autism. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, autism is a uh, new, long neurodevelopmental condition. Um, autism is really quite common. Uh, prevalence estimates are at about 1% to 2% of the population. Now, diagnostically, at least, autism is characterized by differences in social interaction and communication um, and in another domain of restricted repetitive behaviors and interests. So the kind of things that people are into within this uh, social interaction uh, domain 
be uh, delays in the development of, uh, of language. Um, there are marked differences in, uh, in how autistic people communicate. So, for instance, in using and understanding nonverbal aspects of speech uh, and integrating that in with uh, verbal speech, such as eye contact. Um, and also in uh, autistic people maintain and develop friendships, um, at least with uh, neurotypical people uh, and, and other relationships. Uh, and the second uh, domain, uh, the diagnostic framing of autism, uh, is in what's called restrictive repetitive behaviours and interests. So this uh, includes a whole range of behaviours, uh, motor behaviours, so what's called repetitive motor behaviours, which autistic people refer to as stimming, um, to a strong adherence to routine um, and also differences, sensory and, and perceptual differences also fall within this categorization. Um, but really the diagnostic criteria um, doesn't really give a great account of autism. So autism fundamentally reflects a profound difference in how people process information and then act upon that. Um, and there are other elements and ways in, in which uh, autism is both presents both challenges and strengths for autistic people not captured here. So things including uh, differences in motor control, sleep disturbances, um, inertia, um, amongst other things. And so what I've been uh, studying the last few years, uh, what's referred to as the temporal deficit hypothesis of autism. So this was pro proposed by Allman and colleagues um, so essentially, the, the idea is that timing is impacted in some way in autism. Uh, so the suggestion is that there's uh, differences in activity and synchronization, particularly through the striatum. This impacts on the functioning of the internal clock for autistic people. And then this leads to a whole host of uh, effects on how autistic people use and understand time. Um, so this spans across uh, the perception of duration, um, the binding of different uh, temporal, uh, temporally separated uh, sensory signals, and also autistic people think about time, uh, order, and sequencing. What's more, uh, temporal deficit hypothesis proposes that these problems with timing actually underlie the differences in cognition and behavior in autism. So just to give an example, um, in terms of social interaction, what, what they're proposing is that duration plays this like really important role in how we interact with people. So both in how we produce speech, um, in how we integrate um, uh, with other people, how we, uh, in, in timing sense, uh, how we use pauses for effect, uh, a whole host of things. So if, if duration perception is impaired, then this would lead to some of those sort of uh, social differences that you're seeing in autism. Um, also in terms of, a, a, from a temporal cognition perspective, you also need to be able to anticipate. Um, so the idea is that these differences in timing underlie some of those uh, higher level differences in autism. Now, uh, Martin Casasus, who is a PhD student who was working with us, did a systematic review on the experimental work around timing in autism. And I'll explore this a bit more later when I come to experimental work. But just one thing that we noted was that the existing literature uh, really is focused on lab-based experimental studies. But the temporal deficit hypothesis also predicts that there'll be an impact on how autistic people experience time in everyday life. When we did the review, there were just two studies uh, that had looked and they both used the it's about time questionnaire. Uh, this was originally developed by uh, Barclay and colleagues in the 90s to look at timing and its relationship to um, with inhibition in ADHD. It doesn't actually measure a well operationalized single concept, um, but items relate to time management, future and past thinking and time concepts, but researchers generally refer to it as time concept. Um, and yeah, the existing work has shown that autistic people have uh, reduced time concept 
uh, with very large effect sizes, um, but in these studies with, with pretty small samples. Since the review came out, uh, an additional paper has emerged, which was um, using working with autistic adults, looking at uh, the phenomenological experiences around time in a qualitative study. Really, the, the principal finding here was about the use of routine uh, in autistic adults, where they were talking about how uh, they, this was reflect that they use these that use routine for um to accommodate this sort of like lack of awareness of the passage of time but also with strong anxieties about uh, about the future so what we were aiming to do with study one was replicate this uh finding of reduced time concept in autistic children in a much larger sample uh, and also in the same sample use open-ended questions so parents can then uh fill us in, give us, give, describe differences in their own words. Um, this work uh, has been accepted. It should be appearing in autism in the next few days and weeks. We're just waiting for them uh, to, to release it. So uh, in, this in this study, we surveyed 113 parents of autistic children and 201 parents of neurotypical children. Uh, the children were aged between uh, 7 and 12, so this is a really important time in the development of, uh, of timing abilities, both because um, uh, sort of fundamental duration perception is still maturing through this phase, uh, but also by the age of around 8 to 9, um, according to the national curriculum, children should be at this stage of a good sense of time and understanding about how to use concepts uh, related to time through formal education. We didn't match the uh, groups, uh, but all the children were in mainstream education and they were approximately equivalent in the extent to which they communicated verbally, which is very important in, in this questionnaire. Um, so parents completed an online survey. Uh, this included the It's About Time questionnaire. And we also had some open-ended questions. So we developed these with the um, expert group that we work with at, um, in autism at Manchester. This is a group of uh, autistic adults, um, parents of autistic children, and they helped us to develop some questions which would really tap into the sorts of things which might be uh, important to, to the parents and the children here. So this is the, uh, the findings from the questionnaire. This is the uh, overall score on the It's About Time uh, questionnaire. So here, lower scores reflect a reduced time concept. And uh, what you can see quite clearly, we're seeing this, uh, is a, scores are much lower in the autistic group compared to the neurotypical group. So we're quite closely replicating um, the previous findings, uh, but in a much larger sample here. Now, when we move over to uh, looking at the qualitative data, things get really quite striking, I think. Um, so in a way that really wasn't reflected in responses from parents of neurotypical children, there was a really strong sense from the parents that timing had a major impact on their children, um, on their sense of well-being, and impacted on their lives in, in quite a range of ways. Now, this is just illustrated in italics, I have a couple of quotes from these questionnaires um, from, from parents' responses. And um, so we, I, we use thematic analysis uh, to analyze this qualitative data, and we identi identified three themes. So the first theme is uh, temporal knowledge. So this describes problems that the children have with uh, learning about concepts related to time. So the sort of things I'm referring to here um, are being able to use the clock, uh, being able to read the time, but also being able to use appropriate temporal units when referring to time. So things like weeks, uh, months, being able to refer to when things happen to them. And parents know this really was not in keeping with the child's general uh, level of academic performance or mathematical understanding. And then 
This had an impact on the children, uh, which was reflected in, uh, in, in most of the children's, uh, the description for most of the parents, a, a strong focus on time uh, in their children. So how this was reflected was that child would have like a, a strong, uh, a lot of anxieties around things like punctuality, wanting to be places on time, but really these anxieties being exaggerated because they, they lack this temporal knowledge. They weren't really sure of how to uh, correct this. On the other hand, there were some cases where uh, the opposite would happen, where children would just uh, show complete avoidance of time and just really not engage with uh, being on time for things. And in a, uh, in a small number of children, uh, there was actually typical um, or above average understanding of time. In these instances, it seemed that the uh, children were really interested in time and motivated to effortfully teach themselves. Um, but what was interesting it was there wasn't a strong sense in which where this happened that there were improvements in other domains such as planning. This leads well into the next uh, theme, which was prospection. So here, uh, this theme describes uh, the capacity to imagine and prepare for the future. So really what we're getting at here is the parents were describing problems their child seemed to have with really imagining and being able to conceive of uh, the future. Uh, and the way that we try and we sort of try to interpret this is that for, it's somewhat using a sort of Bayesian or um, um, a predictive coding type perspective, the thing that's really the hallmark of the future is its uncertainty. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. For non-autistic people, we are able to develop these uh, sort of flexibly adapt to what happens as we move into uncertain states of the world have some predictions about what will happen and we just adapt to that. Seems like with these autistic children, they were having problems with uh, thinking about the future and instead develop these fairly rigid models of what might happen. Then when future states of the world didn't map onto that, this would be a great cause of distress and anxiety. Um, another area um, in which prospection was relevant was um, with planning. Now, for people who might have worked with autistic children before, this might not seem so surprising uh, in terms of um, visual aids uh, are commonly used to support children with, with planning and, and what's coming ahead. What was quite interesting in the parental accounts was that the uh, efficiency and how effective uh, these sorts of uh, visual aids were uh, was really quite mixed. And it seemed that it depended on the, on the child actually remembering to, to refer to the visual aid at the right time. Um, also um, effects of planning. So there's extensive parental support with planning um, with any activity. Um, parents were really keen to use a lot of strategies to support with this. Um, also another example is um, really trying to avoid overloading their children with, with lots of different plans, lots of different things that they had to do. This is illustrated here in this quote at the bottom where the parent talks about not wanting to give the child too much to do in the morning and so they sleep in their school uniform um, so there's, there's less to, to bear in mind and, and, and plan before getting ready for school. Now there were reports from the parents there's this real sense of uh, of conflict because the parents were very aware that when they were providing this great deal of support to their children, um, it was stopping them from perhaps help, um, developing this really important life skill that's really needed to, to live independently. But on the other hand, they felt under a lot of pressure um, from sort of more immediate concerns, so the, the need to get child to school on time and themselves ready for work. And so they, they felt in this very conflicted state about this. And the third theme is uh, monotropism. So this isn't our own idea. This is, um, this is a theory of autism, which is taken from uh, Dina Murray and colleagues from some really seminal work. This describes how autism is really characterized by an attentional style in which uh, 
an individual's cognitive resources are focused on a relatively narrow range of interests. What this, uh, how this is relevant in the current study, it's how uh, the parents described the child's behaviours as really being, uh, behaviours related to time as being really shaped by uh, their interests, the child's interests and passions. So for instance, uh, the autistic children were described as, as seeing their time as extremely precious and that time spent on activities unrelated to these interests was really seen as wasted. Uh, this led to them really valuing and placing a, a, a high importance in punctuality in others and making sure that things run on time so that they could then uh, devote enough time to the things that they were interested in and wanted to spend their time doing, um, their passions. Another interesting uh, element that emerged was the uh, child, way the parents described the child's awareness of time when they were focused on the things that they were interested in. So. So contrary to what the received wisdom would be here, um, they talked about how their child, uh, many of them talked about their children really being like monitoring closely while engaged in something they're interested in, in order to extract as much as they could uh, from that activity. So they're just really aware of time when doing something they enjoy. Finally, time itself was... Uh, often described as an interest um, in, the, in these children. Um, so uh, getting a lot of uh, joy from doing things like timing things and, and also just, just uh, many other concepts related to time. Although, again, these children didn't show, the children who were really interested in time weren't necessarily good at uh, timing behaviors in other domains. So uh, discussion for that study. So we replicated this, uh, uh, the, the previous work about the reduced, uh, it's about time scores in autistic children. Tests would suggest uh, that time concept may be reduced uh, in autistic children compared to non-autistic neurotypical controls. Um, we also added to the previous work uh, with our qualitative data showing that timing really does have, it seems to have a major impact on these children. Um, and we identified three major themes in this work. So uh, temporal knowledge, prospection, and uh, monotropism. So there are some implications, uh, particularly in an educational setting here. So firstly, there's this sense, there's a strong sense in which punctuality really was a major cause of anxiety for children. So the whole process, particularly thinking of school, of getting ready for school on time, getting to school uh, at this very this specified time uh, was a great cause of anxiety and these children would be arriving at school extremely wound up uh, and in this stressed out state at the start of the day through that whole process of trying to get there on time. There were a few instances where parents did talk about schools that had a more relaxed attitude to their child arriving on time, and that this was, it really worked very well for them. Another consideration is the sense in which ch autistic children might be at a real disadvantage whenever they're completing work under any sort of time pressure. Um, the whole process of the child having to organize and manage their time and, and complete work within a specified time period uh, it just doesn't work for many of these children. And there was also descriptions where even having extra time allocated wasn't helpful. It's just this whole sense of having to how you have to map out and perform within an allocated set of time. And so autistic children might always be at a disadvantage in these contexts. It would also be worth uh, considering in some instances that autistic children might benefit from some targeted support in order to help them learn about time during this, uh, during primary school, um, particularly around these concepts and um, particularly when reading the clock, uh, this might well um, lead to, to benefits in other areas. It's worth highlighting that there are some limitations of this study. 
So firstly, the uh, it's about time questionnaire isn't a validated questionnaire. It has good face validity, uh, but I think there's a real need um, as highlighted by this study of how important timing can be for some really good measures, psychometrically validated measures looking at timing uh, and understanding of time. Also, uh, of course, we only surveyed the parents here um, who only see their children's behaviours within a relatively narrow range of contexts. It can be really valuable to get perspectives from teachers who see uh, these children's behaviours within uh, more structured time environment in school, but also, of course, from the children themselves to get a sense of what's important to them and how they feel about timing themselves. Okay, so that's study one. Uh, I'm now going to be moving over to study two, which is experimental work. And this is going to involve quite a, a big shift in, in approach that we're using. So there's a quite a long history uh, of looking at uh, time and timing. It's long fascinated experimental psychologists. And uh, the, the main approach people use is uh, a timing version of uh, psychophysics. So much like uh, more general psychophysics, temporal psychophysics, we have a, a stimulus, something that we can manipulate uh, systematically. So for instance, this could be uh, tones of different durations and we can manipulate the, the length of that duration. And we've got something that we can measure, which is the participant's response uh, to those stimuli. So by instance, measuring which one was longer than the other. Uh, so we've got the thing we can manipulate and the thing that we can measure, but the thing that we're actually interested in is uh, the individual's perception. Uh, and what we do is we develop theories and models about these perceptual processes that then generate um, uh, empirical predictions that we can then measure in different studies. And the major uh, principal theory of uh, timing in both humans and animals is what's referred to as scalar expectancy theory. Um, which actually a lot of the pioneering work on this was done at the University of Manchester by uh, Professor John Weirden. And um, what scalar expectancy theory predicts in a nutshell, it, it's that uh, the human brain times in a similar way to a, a stock clock, a stopwatch. So it's much, uh, it's much like a clock. So it's called an internal clock model of timing. So the idea would be that we have uh, fluctuations in neural activity, which are used as a, as a pacemaker. This provides a sort of constant pulses, um, which, which functions like a pacemaker. Uh, this is just going on all the time. But if we're then in a situation in which we need to time something, so think of a psychophysics study here, for the duration that we're timing it, we, we pay attention to that stimuli, and this is operationalized as a switch closing. Uh, for the duration there, we accumulate pulses from the pacemaker uh, for as long as that stimuli happens. And then the amount of accumulated pulses provides the reference for, for duration. So all these processes together are described within this framework as perceptual clock-based processes. SET also brings in higher level uh, memory processes so we can hold that um, representation of duration in our working memory this, uh, this decays over time but then can be can be compared to uh, representations of time that we've from longer term memory stores so thinking of our psychophysics experiment again if on a previous trial we accumulated five pulses we can then compare that to three pulses and so the five pulses is seen as is longer than three. So the person doing the study makes the judgment that the first one was longer. So generally, uh, SET provides a good account of, a, of empirical data. Um, it's fairly robust. But what's really useful, um, just, just um, flagging use in our context, is that it provides different predictions and different tasks um, about these different components of the human timing system, uh, which then we can then use to unpick where differences may lie uh, between autistic and non-autistic people. 
So just as a point of reminder, we're looking at this temporal deficit hypothesis, which is expecting, uh, which predicts that there's a general timing impairment in autism, but also that these problems with timing actually underlie cognition and behavior in autism. Um, something interesting to know as well, that there's work going on at the moment, there's a, a multi-lab project in Europe, where they're looking at the use of virtual reality um, as a possible intervention uh, for timing in, in autism and in other uh, conditions as well. So it all sounds uh, great, but uh, uh, this net things are never so clear. So in our systematic review, uh, really the main thing that Martin found um, was that there have been a whole variety as a real range of different studies that have been done using quite different approaches all claiming to be looking at time, um, but they're really with quite separable uh, cognitive processes underlying performance. So Martin developed a taxonomy in an attempt to sort of group together these tasks. Um, <coughs> so he, he devised those task measuring, so basic perceptual sensitivities for time, uh, being able to compare duration and relative timing. More SET, scalar expectancy type timing, uh, tasks that have been used within that framework, and then a fairly broad area of higher level timing. So just different types which involve, unquestionably involve other cognitive processes, both timing in everyday life, but also how time interacts with things like memory. What Martin found was that really for the sensitivity and SET type work, Findings were really quite mixed. Uh, there are a number of studies showing that there were these uh, reduced performance in autistic samples compared to neurotypical controls, but there are also a good number of studies showing no differences. And even in the case of uh, sensitivity type tasks, uh, there are a number of studies showing improved performance in the autistic group. So the opposite of the predictions of the temporal deficit hypothesis. On the other hand, there's, there's a much smaller number of these higher level studies, uh, but they more consistently show differences in the direction that uh, there's predicted uh, diminished performance in the autistic group. But something that really cuts through the entire literature, these studies are really piecemeal, using just like individual tasks in quite small samples, and there's a lack of attempt to replicate findings. So this is the sort of thing that we've been trying to address in the autism timing project. And so study two that I'm going to be talking about, uh, we recruited autistic and non-autistic neurotypical adults who were aged 18 to 45, and they completed a battery of temporal psychophysics tasks that tapped into the different domains of timing that we identified in our review. We also used uh, both visual and auditory versions of these tasks to ask whether timing differences are, are modality dependent in autism. And we also included uh, questionnaire measures of timing in daily life uh, and what's called re retrospective timing measures. And I'll explain what those are in a moment. So really the aim here was to try and really improve that characterization of timing uh, in, in autistic adults. So the temporal deficit hypothesis predicts that timing sensitivity should be diminished across all those tasks, but we expected that it's probably a bit more nuanced than that. Uh, and by using these different tasks, we can really try to start highlight which processes are actually affected in autism, and then we might be able to start looking at how uh, something about this and how we can move forward. Um, as an additional aim, we wanted to assess the another claim from the temporal deficit hypothesis, um, which is that, that timing underlies uh, fundamental differences in, in autism. And so we investigated as, a, as an analysis whether performance on these psychophysics tasks map onto uh, autistic, autistic traits. So uh, we tested 57 autistic adults and 91 neurotypical controls. The participants were well matched for age, full scale IQ and uh, sex. We uh, questionnaire measures showed that there were, as we'd expect, uh, much increased sensory, motor and autistic uh, 
uh, traits uh, in everyday life in, in our autistic sample compared to neurotypicals. Oh, and the study was, was pre-registered as well, and that's available online. So I'm going to really give a very high level overview. There are quite a lot of different tasks here. And I'm going to, in giving this high level overview, gloss over some of the experimental detail uh, and also some of the, I'm going to focus really on the main, major findings. Um, but do, of course, ask me at the end if there's anything that you want to explore in a bit more detail. So I'm just going to look at each of those domains um, to pick apart uh, what we found. So firstly, looking at basic sensitivity, um, in a duration sensitivity task, what's referred to as the temporal difference threshold uh, in the timing literature. On this task, participants are presented with two durations back to back, and they just have to say which one was longer. We then adjusted the difference between those durations using an adaptive staircase in order to determine their threshold. So here, lower thresholds mean that uh, the participant is more sensitive in their duration judgments. Uh, and the important thing is that there were no differences between the autistic or uh, between the autistic and the neurotypical group for either the auditory or the visual task. Uh, another sensitivity task was relative timing sensitivity. Here, um, this is a temporal order judgment task participants presented with two stimuli uh, in quick succession, and they have to say which one they thought was first. And again, we, we adjust the, the gap between them there um, and take uh, in, using adaptive staircase to, to estimate the participant's threshold. And again here, no difference uh, between the groups for either auditory uh, or, or visual task. So take home from this, there were no differences in, in either duration or relative timing sensitivity between the autistic and the neurotypical groups. So next, I'm gonna move over to tasks within the SET framework. So firstly, I need to uh, assess really clock processes um, is the verbal estimation task. Here, the, the participant makes a direct timing judgment about uh, a duration. So we present them with a range of different stuff. The participant says how long they thought they were. We take the participant's mean estimate for each of those stimuli, fit a regression to that um, to get the slope as a measure of sensitivity. So here a slope of one would mean the participant is performing perfectly. Uh, and there were no differences. Uh, between on the auditory or the visual task between the autistic and neurotypical groups. Next is uh, a clock and memory task. So this is a temporal generalization task. Here, the participant is presented with a duration. They're asked to try and remember that. And then subsequently on, on different trials, they're presented with uh, different durations and are asked, is that the same duration as the one that you remembered previously? We then use signal detection analysis to sensitivity. Um, so here, higher values mean the participant is more sensitive. Um, so the important thing here, it's not amazingly clear from these rain cloud plots, um, but overall, um, the autistic group were, were worse, had lower sensitivity in comparison to the neurotypicals. Uh, so there was a, a, a group effect on this task. So uh, what, what this, what's this showing is that the autistic group were less sensitive on a task which involved both clock and memory components, but not uh, just a clock component. Okay, finally, uh, I'm looking at higher level timing. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, there's a retrospective timing. Uh, this is commonly used in the time perception literature. Um, what we did here, so that the, the when I was doing these tasks, the participant came down to the basement at the university in, in the Conus building. There was like absolutely no cues to time there. It's windowless and we removed all clocks. And what I did was at the start of the testing session, I asked the participant to give me their phone or watch or what have you. And then at a fixed point in the testing schedule, I asked them how long has passed since I took the phone off them. 
Uh, this gives us uh, the difference between the participants estimate and the actually elapsed time as a proportion of total elapsed time. Um, so a, a, a score of zero here would mean that the participant is performing perfectly. Uh, negative scores indicate they're underestimating, positive overestimating. An interesting thing is that uh, even though participants are doing these pretty boring psychophysics tasks the whole time, they were tending to underestimate how long had passed. Um, but the important thing is there were, again, no differences between autistic and neurotypical group. Um, and then uh, I also gave the participants questionnaires. Um, so there's a self-report version of the It's About Time uh, questionnaire. Here we replicated the effect in kids. Um, the, the autistic sample produced a lower uh, scores on this questionnaire, suggesting time concept is reduced uh, compared to controls, but to a much smaller degree than, than in the parental report version. And then uh, we also gave them another questionnaire, which is the time structure questionnaire. And scores were actually increased in the autistic group here um, compared to controls. So suggesting time structure is improved. So what I really want to point out here is that this shows that there are differences in how autistic people self-report to using time in daily life. It's not reflective of uh, deficiencies in, in time. So just very quickly, I'll just uh, talk about this additional analysis that we did. So what we're trying to look at here was whether um, scores on these different psychophysics measures uh, were, there was a very strong relationship with their uh, self-reported sensory, motor, and autistic traits. Um, so we did a principal components analysis. Here, what we would have been expecting would be if, if there really was a strong relationship between these measures, that they might all load on to an, a single component. We haven't found that. Um, I don't think we've found really strong evidence to say that there's no relationship whatsoever. So this is a plot. Uh, increasingly large dots mean the increasingly strong correlation, blue meaning positive and red meaning negative. Um, they, all these items do load positively onto the first component, then it gets a bit bit more mixed, um, a bit more mixed after that. So to summarize um, the work from this study, we really think the takeaway finding is the evidence doesn't support the temporal deficit hypothesis as originally proposed. There's not a general timing deficit in autistic adults at least. We found no differences in duration or relative timing sensitivity or in uh, basic clock processes. But we did see these between group differences uh, when we introduced uh, memory. Uh, when, so it could be that there's something about the encoding or retrieval of duration in working memory in autism, which might uh, require some further work. Uh, as I mentioned before, we observed these differences on the questionnaires. So just to summarize that, it seems that the sort of self-report about time management and concept of time is reduced in autistic adults, but also the autistic adults make better use of time structure in their daily life. They sort of, that's really about making the most of the time available to you and, and really enjoying your time. Uh, so this is also something that would be interesting to look at a bit further. And we've not really seen uh, any strong evidence there that these psychophysics measures relate to everyday traits. And just along that, in a similar vein, um, a recent study in autistic children found a, um, a negative relationship, negative correlation between uh, thresholds on a relative timing task uh, and autistic traits. Uh, again, this is going in the opposite direction to what's, what's predicted. So um, I think this needs more work, but it, and, and perhaps different ways of looking, attacking this point, but it's not really very persuasive that timing really underlies uh, these everyday behaviors. So um, coming to the end of this project, um, and there are uh, lots of points of future direction and conclusions. So uh, thinking about these two studies together, could be that time perception is impacted in autistic children and uh, some, somewhere across development is reaching uh, becoming more similar to neurotypicals in adulthood. So it'd be really valuable to do a study like this in autistic children. 
Now, even in neurotypical children, you see these quite marked, uh, this map like um, developmental trajectory of, uh, of timing, basic timing and time perception. And a lot of recent work has shown how important working memory uh, and attention is. Uh, and, and I think that could be really highly relevant here uh, in autism as well. So a uh, future piece of work uh, unpacking the role of working memory and attention in timing in autistic kids using a similar comprehensive investigation to what we've used here would be great. Um, we're also well aware that these kind of, uh, th this is the way we look at timing in experimental psychology, where it's quite detached from timing that we do in everyday life. We don't sit around tending to think about how long durations are. So we're interested in, in how timing, timing integrated in, into sort of more complicated behaviours, particularly uh, social interaction, um, and, and where that might be affected uh, in, in autism. Also, there's a couple more studies that we're still doing. Um, in this project, looking at relative timing of multisensory stimuli, uh, motor timing, and I, and I do have a load of interviews that I'm analysing from autistic adults about timing and time perception. So finally, just to say thank you to the study team, uh, Luke, who's the PI, Emma Gowan and El Polyakov, uh, also Martin Casasus, who I mentioned earlier, who uh, did the grunt work of the review, but also worked closely with me in, in collecting data for study two, which was quite a considerable amount of work. Uh, also a huge thank you to the Autism at Manchester expert group who have been uh, advising us throughout this project. Uh, and, and of course, to all the study project, uh, participants without who this wouldn't be possible. Uh, and thank you to you all for listening. Thank you so much, Dan. Um, a wonderful talk, as you, as you indicated at the end there, um, very comprehensive in terms of your systematic approach to understanding timing, so that was really interesting. Um, we've got some time for um, questions. So um, I'll, start, I'll start off with the chat first, and if anybody would like to um, ask a question in the usual way, then uh, please feel free to pop on your video and, and, uh, and mic. So, um, this is a question from uh, Rob Lee, uh, Dan. Um, firstly, your work is very interesting, and he is uh, trained to be an educational psychologist and is interested in programs or interventions that uh, are, can be recommended to schools to support the time concept. You mentioned that you, you mentioned that interest in time doesn't always translate into timekeeping on tasks. Do you have any suggestions for how to support the development of timekeeping awareness on tasks? Quite a few schools I work with already use the hourglass timers for timed activities, but I haven't seen any research on whether this is effective or not. That's a really interesting question. Um, and hourglass timers is not something I'd come across. That's actually something I'd also like to know a bit more about as well. Um, and, and would like to, yeah, using this also as an opportunity to reach out a bit to, to anyone who works in education, particularly about how time is being used in an educational setting. It's something we'd like to better understand. Um, what's working, what's not. In terms of where this is effective in autism, th this really, like I mentioned, is the first work that's being done um, on uh, what, what autistic children are experiencing, what that actually is like in real life. So I, I'm not aware of any work that's then actually shown what you can do, um, what's what's working effectively in schools. But just anecdotally, from speaking to a lot of people, um, both out in, in schools that work with autistic children, uh, but also uh, clinically uh, with services we've been working with, working with autistic adults, that, that we do a lot of different, uh, just like informally, a lot of different approaches that are being used. Uh, around time and understanding time. Most of it's about um, the structure and organization in the day, the sort of thing that I mentioned earlier, visual aids, how time is structured. Uh, but in terms of developing that sort of like un intuitive understanding of, of time, that the duration and passage of time, I'm, I'm not aware of anything and, and would love to know if there is anything out there. Yeah, yeah, indeed, exactly. Um, a question in, in, I guess, in, in relation to your methods then, did they report the durations in seconds? So what were those units when the, in, the, in your... Oh, in, so in the experimental task, it was actually yeah. seconds. So it's quite, when you 
people to sit down and do it, you present this verbal estimation task to them. So I should first add, this is widely used. All those tasks, are, um, we, we didn't invent them. They're taken from the wider experimental literature. Luke is a, a time perception researcher. He hasn't really done any work in autism before. He, he uh, trained under John Weirden. That's his background. So this ta these tasks are widely used. And the verbal estimation task, you get people to come in and you explain, you're going to be doing this. You're estimating in milliseconds. People's first impression is, I cannot do that. I have no idea how to do that. But once they, once they do the task, they're actually remarkably good at it. Most people are really good at this task. Um, and they're able to do to, to, to convert into milliseconds. Um, once you have a bit of an understanding of what a thousand milliseconds and so on, people can use that framework for, for making estimates about time. But it is a little bit unusual. Yeah, yeah, of course. And um, a question from um, Bev. Uh, imagine you did the same uh, psychophysics tests with dyslexics. What would you predict? That's an interesting question. So I don't know much about the like, basic duration perception in uh, dyslexic samples, but there is, so I did during my PhD, uh, my real interest from this side of things is particularly with relative timing uh, because of that interest in the sort of more perceptual side of things. Um, and so autistic people, both adults and children, have this uh, problem with parsing, temporally separated uh, stimuli, uh, and you see the same effect in, in dyslexia. Uh, there's a similar, particularly for audiovisual uh, uh, temporal order judgments, there's, there's, there's problems there, uh, sensitivity there. I don't know about uh, basic duration perception, but it, it would be really interesting. And, and those kinds of studies as well, I think are really important of like comparing across conditions because we've got autism, dyslexia, ADHD to different extents. We've got a lot of the participants in our study. Uh, it's very rare that we have autistic people who, who just have a diagnosis of autism and it can overlap with these other conditions as well. And parsing a little bit, what's due to, uh, to, to which condition, what characteristic of autism and, and where do these differ is a, it's a fundamental question across the literature generally, but I think it would be relevant here. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, another question here. Um, have you ever measured autistic people's ability to measure time when several senses are combined at the same time, e.g. visual and auditory stimuli together? Could autistic people have difficulties because the speed at which they record the individual senses and the difference in speed between them is different from neurotypical people. Mm. So, um, well, yes and no, because again, timing is quite a, a broad area. With the relative timing stuff, we've done a bit um, on that. With um, um, usually tends to be pairs of senses. Again, about it's about passing and determining order. Um, so we have an ongoing study which we're trying to deliver online, uh, where we're looking at audiovisual uh, synchrony perception. But in terms of that sort of basic duration perception, we haven't done that uh, yet. That would be something that would be interesting to do as well. Um, trying to understand modality differences in timing is, is really, really vital. Um, I'm trying to think if there has been, there has been a previous study which used um, you know, bisection tasks. So it has been done. I now, off the top of my head, can't remember exactly what the findings were. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a really relevant uh, issue, yeah. Yeah, cool. I mean, I've, I've done a little bit of work on motor timing in autism uh, and quite a lot of work on motor timing and relative timing, um, perception and learning um, from a motor, motor perspective and obviously mm. and also a observational learning imitation perspective. Would you be able to comment on some of your work in motor timing? I'd be quite interested to hear about that if possible. Yeah, well, unfortunately it's not launched yet. So everything's okay. been by the pandemic. Um, we were nearly finished with the study two and then the pandemic uh, hit. So uh, luckily I was able to analyze the data from that. The motor timing study that we were going to do is quite a simple. Um, it's a uh, tapping tapping tasks. So those sort of like very low level type of 
uh, performance and then um, what's called the, the wing Christofferson model where you can using uh, it's a mathematical model where you can parse out where uh, variance in timing is coming from the motor system and where it's coming from uh, more like the internal clock. So we're planning to try and do that study online using Gorilla. Yeah. Uh, how that will pan out, I don't know. Um, but um, yes, it's, it's a really interesting area and it's something because uh, Emma Gowan, as you know, is really interested in the motor side of things. Yeah. And also, when, as we're talking about these more complicated tasks, that's something I'd be quite interested in moving into uh, with this work, looking at the role that timing's playing really in, in motor differences uh, in, in autism. Yeah, yeah, because obviously the quite a lot of work is showing that there's motor planning uh, differences in autism. And, and I wonder whether that was, I mean, we've done some work on motor planning where there's a lot more variability in the, in the planning of actions. Um, and that seems to be a, a consistent effect. Uh, and what we've also showed through learning then with autistic children is that um, that variability decreases with practice. So you, you know, you set up certain training processes and that variability decreases and therefore planning improves. Mm. Um, any sort of ideas about can you train timing perception? Is that is that is it? Yeah, that's another really good question. And that's one of the things that we're thinking about moving forward. Yeah. Yes, you can train timing perception and particularly that thing, the variability being really key. So it doesn't yeah. answer what we've found here because we've not really, that was something else I've, I've not at all covered, but something else we were interested in and have looked at um, about not just accuracy, but variability differences. And, and essentially there aren't any here. Um, but that's something that is, is, yeah, you can do with timing as well. Um, you can reduce that, improve accuracy and diminish variability uh, with timing. We've sort of, we've, with feedback, um, people are, have, have a good aware, like metacognitive awareness and how to, how to reduce that. So yeah, yeah. something that's super interesting and, and yeah, again, a, a study that would be really worth doing. Daniel, sorry, I just have a follow-up question to that. Is that, are you able to see improved timing within autistic adults or is that just within adults more broadly? Sorry, yeah, that's just more broadly in, in okay. neuro populations. So um, people haven't done that yet, yet in autism. Okay. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Lindsay. Any other questions from the um, audience? Have you heard of the metronome? Pardon me? Metronome, a timing device? Yes. You use, did you use that? Oh, we've not used that here. Or oh, in terms of feedback um, for improving timing. Yes. Yes, that's interesting. Um, we, we haven't used that. And, and studies of uh, timing, how timing can be improved with feedback, yeah, it tends to be through feedback. But yeah, I suppose also with a, with a metronome that would also, um, that would also probably help there. Um, and that's and that's much like what we're with, with this sort of like model of how the internal clock works. It has that kind of like you can entrain that using uh, using repetitive stimuli, much like a metronome. So that yeah, something that's that's, that's very interesting. Yeah. Did you catch my um, comment about mismatched negativity in babies who are going to become dyslexic? I haven't commented on that. I, I don't know much about that work. I know the mismatch negativity work in, in autism, but I, I don't know. I don't know much about that. In but the, you said there wasn't a response in autism, but there is in dyslexia. I can't give you the quote right now, but you can look it up, Dutch researchers. Mm. Oh, so the, the work that you looked at mismatch negativity so um in a timing sense uh there's a so the, uh, that was in the review i didn't go into much detail about the specifics of the studies that have been done because they're so mixed um but the work that's been done, looking at duration uh looking at mismatch negativity in autistic children and adults has tended to show differences so um, reduced in the autistic group, which would reflect or would suggest uh, uh, reduced sensitivity to time. Uh, but I think it's only two or three studies in autism. But has, has it been looked at more extensively in, in, dys in dyslexia? I think so, yes. But as you say, all ERPs can be different according to the different um, well, experimental design. Cool. Um, 
one minute past five, Dan, but I'm going to ask you one more question from the chat because I think it'd be quite interesting given that you mentioned kind of like Bayesian ideas of, and in terms of your work. Um, question here, how do, you, how do you relate these findings to the recently proposed theories of predictive coding and autism? Mm. So yeah, we have, we have linked that formally in the paper that we're, we're writing at the moment. Um, so one way of thinking about that here in terms of our findings from the second set of studies is um, that people have uh, tried to reconceptualize SET, the SET framework in a Bayesian perspective. Um, so if you're familiar with, with Bayesian theory, so like the, the prior here would be understood as the memory component in SET. Um, and the likelihood would be the clock, um, the clock processes. So and the posterior would be uh, the decision. And so if we think of it within that conceptual understanding, there's, this is an in, what we've seen here is an impact in the prior, but not in the likelihood uh, or the other stages in the process. And then linking that to uh, theories about the uh, Bayesian theories in autism, that's really what, what, what's been hypothesized. Um, so that the idea being that there might be, that, goes in different direction, but there's some impact in the use of priors and how priors are integrated with likelihood information in autism. So we're sort of trying to conceptually fuse the two, the timing and the, and the sort of Bayesian perspective in, in making sense of findings from study two. Uh, and also study one was, was as called qualitative. I did, I did refer to uh, predictive coding theory, but a, a thing that really comes out of that, which I think is really interesting, and Perhaps for many people, it won't be surprising if you've worked with autistic people, but I don't think it's been thoroughly looked at before and perhaps not in the right way. But it's thinking about the future, the future as this just uncertain, as a just uncertainty. That's really what the future is. And there's problems that parents were describing in how their children think about the future and whether they can do that. Um, and I haven't fully analyzed the, the qualitative data from autistic adults, but there's a similar sort of things are coming up there as well. Like these, all these different, like quite roundabout strategies that people will, will use to manage that. It's just high degree of uncertainty they have about what's going to happen in the future and how they try and bring some structure to that, that, that neurotypical people don't think about at all. So yeah, different perspectives and frameworks and ways of looking at that experimentally would be would be really really good. I think. Absolutely. Um, I don't want to be cheesy, but we're out of time, Dan. And um, so thank you so much for your um, your time this afternoon and your expertise in this particular area. Uh, we met a while ago when you were doing our, your your PhD. So um, good luck with your. Uh, further work at, in Sheffield thank and you. Uh, have a lovely afternoon and, and uh, thank you for all joining this afternoon for the SENSE seminar and we'll see you next week. Okay, thanks a yeah, lot. Thanks very much for having me Spencer and everyone. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks Sam.